storage readiness. Do you mind uh, either just lapeling that, or I could hang it up here it's for sound? It's a microphone for sound for me. Oh, sure. Or not. Okay, sorry. Or I could just put it up there if you don't like it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, so future readiness, which incorporates college readiness and career readiness. The big buzzword this year is personalized learning. And once you see what personalized learning actually looks like, you will see why it's so difficult to actually implement it in the classroom. And so here's the problem that was stated in this technology report, personalized learning. Does everybody agree with that? So go ahead. Any questions, comments, feel free to just jump in. The bigger problem is implementation. How do you do it? And what I'm gonna do in this presentation is take it down to basically ground zero and take it from a kid's point of view and a parent's point of view and show you what personalized learning looks like. Uh, and then I want you to, as I'm doing that, I want you to think about this question posed by Sir Ken Robinson. So it's about future readiness. How do you, what are we doing today if we don't know what the jobs look like? Should we even be doing that? This is personalized learning, the poster child. As a child, any child personalizes learning. It's nothing new. It's not revolutionary, it's not disrupt disruptive. It's just a child at play, essentially, in its simplest form. But race to the top funding is, in, is going to, the government's trying to uh, ensure that it does become part of your curriculum. So how do people learn? Basically, if we were to put you in the desert somewhere, right, with a tribe of people, first thing you'd do is you'd have to build a network, communicate with them and figure out the lay of the land. How do I survive? And that's really what learning is. It's analogous to learning to live in a new environment. You observe, you respond to an environment, and then you leverage the expertise of other people. And that's how you learn. And it's with a discipline, and it's within an environment as well. So if you substitute the desert for like math or social studies, it's the same framework. Yeah. Okay, this is what it looks like for a kid. So he's playing Jedi Knight, Star Wars. Everything in blue there, basically it's him learning the landscape of Star Wars. Emotional connection is the first thing that happens. Exploration, taking risks, making connections to himself. How does it relate to my strengths and interests? Where's my place in the landscape? Am I a novice, am I an apprentice, am I an expert? What's my degree of specialization? What toys do I have? What resources do I have? What technology do I have? That's how you learn the landscape. And through that, you achieve your identity and you build paths to purpose. So it's driven totally by the child, all those things and whether it's math, social studies, whatever, this is what it looks like. Supported by any of those people, in this case, parents, resources, technology, peers. But all those things there support personalized learning, all those elements. Different ways to assess it. Ohio has come up with credit flex, there's holistic assessment, authentic assessment, traditional grades, and self-assessment. In this case, a kid simply playing, there's no formal assessment, it's just self-assessment. Am I enjoying this? Am I you know, feeling good about it? And therefore, it's reflection. Outcomes. So everything we know about learning, all the good things we want to happen in school, happens in personalized learning. All those things, uh, what we want for our kids in the classroom. Growth mindset, autonomy, mastery, purpose. But how do you implement it in schools? I think it's very difficult to do it because it's essentially like, imagine having 30 kids in your room and everybody wants to go do their own thing. 
explore whatever it is that interests them. I think the sweet spot is right there at the interface of home, school, and community. So it would be some sort of centralized system that was at the interface of those things that actually tracked a student's learning and development from K-12. The question is, who builds it, who funds it, who maintains it? So basically, everybody, the parent, the child, and you, the teacher, would be providing input into a holistic view of the child. So as the child was doing something in math, right, you would personalizing, he was personalizing his math experience, you would put some input into it, right? You become the facilitator. It's not about you just teaching uh, in the classroom. Okay, possible solution, two things. One, I've come up with this future readiness model for K-12, and the second thing is a smart start profile, which is a holistic view of kids. Future readiness, are you all familiar with growth mindset, Carol Dweck? Right, so basically, future readiness, I believe, means you have a growth mindset. Everything that you're doing is, is going towards college and career readiness. And you are a career builder and you are a designer of your career as well. Go ahead. So here's the model. So starting in third grade, we have this thing called finding your extra. And that comes from Thomas Friedman, actually, who wrote a book called uh, um, that, was, that Used to Be Us. And he came up with this concept of uh, average is over, what's your extra? So the extra is just those things about you, about each child that are unique. So we start with finding the extra, and we, it's a constant, it's a process of actual iterative, um, what is it, iterative uh, contact, you know, ongoing contact with the child, lots and lots of small wins. So you're just basically acknowledging these things that they do, and, and you've, but you've got to somehow put it in a repository somewhere just so that the child, the parent, and you can see the p changes in patterns of interest and development over time. So it's a holistic evaluation. It's quantitative and qualitative feedback. So, you know, not only do you have grades and things, but you also have sort of like a rubric type, you know, comments, uh, comments from you that don't just say, you know, it's not a stock comment. It's something that really does get to the heart of what the child is doing identification of extras. And you can see here, all three programs support college and career readiness. Okay, so this is a sample profile, go ahead. Average is over, what's your extra? So it presents students with a picture of themselves beyond just grades and test scores. It validates their extras. And what we found from parents is that it really helps them Parents today are really confused about what they should do, which is why you have the helicopter parent and why you have the overscheduled child. Because there, they just follow the flock of their peers when it comes to, well, this is what I feel like I should do. He's got to learn Chinese. He's got to do this. He's got to do that. And it's not really rela related to their child at all. And so what this does is when we give them a, a third party and partial perspective, aren't we, you see, they go, great, so I can continue this whatever it is the child's doing, ballet or something, that, they, that the parent might not have thought was had value. So the goal for this is to, we want students to feel that they're awesome, okay? This is what we want from them, go ahead. So we highlight, we, we actually take a uh, three criteria, academic performance, context, and intellectual vitality that we look through their performance uh, at school, in and out of school, actually, formal and informal learning. We look at their success factors. Go ahead. And it's all about home, school, and community. Go ahead. And it's done as a story. It's pitched as a, uh, a story for the child that the child can actually go ahead and relate to. So, personalized learning. Does it answer the question and what are the issues? And that's the, kind of what we're here for, to talk about. What do you think? Does personalized learning address the, does it prepare kids for the 21st century? Does it prepare kids 
how are you going to implement that in the classroom? How do you how do you see it? Do you see it as just this thing that's going to come down and is unmanageable? Yeah. So I've thought a lot about this, and I'm also a believer in personal personalizing and mm -hmm. creation of the environment. <laughs> Or is there a way that we can take existing institutions and repurpose them a little bit and, and change the mindset and change the practices um, so that we don't have to risk leaving behind or disappoint that population that suddenly sort of fit into the, perhaps the next goal, fit into the current model very well, but into what, what may come at all? Um, things like, um, I don't know, the big, the big picture learning model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was you mentioned the the new? Did you mention the Common Core? As you know, what was it that you mentioned that some of your undergraduates changed? Race to the top. Race to the top. Race to the top. Right. So how how do you see that forcing this? Because there's four hundred million dollars that the government's putting out, and that they just put out, and they're basically saying, you know, if, and right now it's just Title One schools, but. Their whole thing is they want to get away from students and just seat time, and they want to basically move the teacher role to facilitator as opposed to, you know, the current role. They want to see you facilitate the development of kids' talents rather than actually teaching them a set curriculum. And it's early yet, but does anyone have any success? Well, the, the funds have just... They, they've developed the criteria and people have got till I think the end of October to do it but you know here's the thing I don't think it's going to work because if you look at the criteria that they're trying to use I don't know it's kind of like you know giving someone the plans to build a house and you go that is not a good looking house you know and the, here are all the problems with it and, and actually a lot of people I think including big picture learning put all these amendments in because there was a forum that went on for a couple of months where you could put input and they said, here are the problems that we're seeing with your model. And so, you know, I don't know. I, it's, I think it's going to be the house that Jack built. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I just don't think it's, anytime you're driven by money and instead of having, I think what's important to me is having the solid educational philosophy and research behind something mm -hmm. and to, to just scale it very, on very, very small things on a very, very fundamental level, but with just small groups of kids. Let's see if this works before before we do this whole district-wide, school-wide thing. Right. Sorry? Safety seats are appropriate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Does anyone have any other thoughts on? Yeah. Um, in a small sense, uh, Khan Academy, don't you feel that kind of shakes up a little bit where a, a teacher who's uh, fundamentally been doing it from the textbook mm -hmm. tasks every student on the same task, mm -hmm. where if they were flipped the classroom a little bit, and the students, uh, they become their guide in Khan Academy. And that really becomes that student's PLM in that small little venue of math where they can go beyond uh, where they might have been in the classroom and, and he, can, he or she can focus on the student who needed that assistance. And then at the same time, the parents who want to help with them, they can become peers within that yeah. world. Uh, you, you talked about the community as a whole, and they can also work with the student's peers uh, within their own classroom I mean, I know that's a little teeny thing, but... But that's exactly how it is going to happen. It's going to be those small things. The big question that I have when you think about it is if you do, you know, the research on learning says this, that the way people learn is they actually learn from experts, right? And obviously, Sal Khan is an expert. But what experts do is that they present people, they have such a knowledge of the big picture that they can actually teach you They'll give you the context for what it is you're learning, which is what a great teacher does. They give you the context, whether it's in history or anything, about what it is you're learning and why it is that you're learning it. And 
With personalized learning, um, actually Ohio just implemented this thing called HQT, high quality teachers. So if you're a special